Good morning, families. Good to be with you all. Good to be together. Um, so today we're going to be taking a look at a sermon entitled Glory in the Church. Um, this is from the book of Ephesians, and uh, it's a, a great study just on how we have a responsibility as a community of believers to bring glory to God. You know, we are here not for ourselves, although we benefit and we are blessed in so many ways. But ultimately, we're here to reflect God's glory and glorify Him in all that we do, but particularly <clears throat> within our relationships with one another. You know, the church in Ephesus um, <clears throat> was a, a, a fantastic church. They had lots of amazing people come in and lead the church. The Apostle Paul, Timothy, and even the Apostle John were part of that church. But they had a lot of pressure on them, and I'm sure we can relate to pressure for us as Christians, but they had pressure within, whether they should be focusing more on kind of the, the Jew, some of the Jewish practices, but also pressure from without. And so they had, they were in a city where there was, you know, the, the temple to Artemis or to Diana. Um, and so there was a lot of pagan worship that was also trying to creep in and influence the church. So they, they were really fighting to maintain their focus on Jesus. They were fighting to maintain their faith and also to maintain their unity. And I think for them, they were definitely at a crossroads. And I think for us as a community of believers, we face very similar challenges, don't we? Even though it's, we're 2,000 years removed from that, we still have a lot of pressure from the world around us, from you know, the different baggage that we bring when we come into the community. To keep that unity can be challenging at times. So hopefully what we look at today will help um, solidify our love for one another, but also really focus on how we can glorify God. This lesson today as well, by the way, is the final message that's part of our Real Friendships and Healthy Relationships um, series that we've been doing this year, or this, the, the latter part of this year. So it hopefully will tie everything together. On Wednesday, we will be at our midweek service. We'll also be, you'll be informed of what our theme focus will be for next year as well. So please come on out to midweek so we can uh, let you know about that. We can have a great time of prayer about that as well. But let us go. Speaking of prayer, let us pray at this time. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your amazing, amazing word. Thank you, God, that it gives us life, it gives us faith, and it calls us to be people that we cannot be on our own. God, it calls us higher. It points us to you. It points us to Jesus. And so we pray today, Father, as we examine your scriptures, as we learn from your word, Father, that we will be people, a community, who bring you glory. We thank you, Father, for the things that you've been doing in our church this year, how it, just the, the many numbers of people who are here, new people, Father, people who have been baptized into Christ, God. What an encouragement. We know you are truly being glorified. So, Father, continue to teach us, continue to help us. Help us, Lord, to surrender all that we are to you because you deserve nothing less, God, than our full devotion. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So as you know, the book of Ephesians is divided up into two halves. Um, chapters 1 to 3, we find 54 different spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. This is amazing. So when you are a Christian, this is what you get to enjoy and benefit from simply by being in a relationship with God. All of these things are there to, to encourage us at the end of chapter 3, verse 21, we find this particular verse, which is where our, the title comes from. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And this is a real pivotal verse. So the verse here is saying that our function, the reason why we even exist as a community is to bring glory to God. And it's to bring glory to God in the same way that Jesus did. That's how powerful the impact of our relationship should be on glorifying God. And so what we see is in chapters 1 to 3, we get to discover why we should bring glory to God because of all those many blessings that we have. Are you with me? But chapters 4 through 6... They then teach 
how we bring glory to God. So it's split into the two ways. One way is why, and the other portion is how we do that. So we're going to focus today on the second part. But the why and the how, they all hang on one single word. And the key to it all is love. That is the why, because God loves you. Because God loves us. That's why we bring glory to God. And how we bring glory to God is love. It is simply love. And it is the central theme for the entire book of Ephesians. It's the core principle that you see at work throughout the entire letter. And what's amazing is we see the word love appear 17 times in just six chapters. It is the most of any of the prison epistles. Why? Because some of the disciples there had been deserting their faith. Some were leaving the community. There were conflicts within the church. There were many issues that they were facing. There were spiritual battles that were going on. And so God says to them, listen, if you can just hold on to love, you can ride whatever storm comes your way. And I think that's a key lesson for us to remember. So the, the letter focuses on two forms of love. It focuses on God's love for us, but also our love for one another. Why should, God, why should the church bring glory to God? Because he loves us. How should the church bring glory to God? Through our love for one another. Okay, you got it? All right, let's explore. So we're going to start off in, uh, in chapter 3. <clears throat> verse 16. And this is what Paul says. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Quite an amazing passage. Quite an incredible passage. But he's trying to let them know that there's no way that you can fully grasp all of God's love and how much he loves you. But you've got to at least try to begin to understand that. The church was largely Gentile, Christian, uh, Gentile Christians, by the way. And he's saying to them, listen, I don't want you just to know about God's love on an intellectual level. I don't want you just to you know, be aware of it through just the teaching, but I want you to experience it. I want you to feel it. I want you to deeply understand how, how loved you are by God. And that's why he spent three chapters teaching them how deeply loved they were. But he also says to them, listen, it's more than just you knowing this. but Because if you fully understand how deeply loved you are, it will overflow in your relationships with one another. That if your lives are deeply rooted in love, if your faith is founded in love, if your action comes from a place of love, then you'll be filled to the full measure of God because of love. It's then that we can then love one another. You can't love if your love bank is empty. Steve was talking about that at our harvest, our park service. Where do we fill our love bank? in our time with God, being aware of how deeply loved we are by him. And it then just pours over, it bubbles over, so that we, you can't help love one another in that way, because it's just so much a part of who you are. Now, by the way, how was Paul ensuring that they knew to grow in love themselves, but also in awareness of God's love? Well, he was teaching them, but he was also praying for them. You see, at this moment, Paul wasn't in Ephesus. He was in prison. So he says, I'm praying for you that you will be filled with all of this. I'm praying that you will have a knowledge of God's love. You know, one of the greatest gifts that we can give to one another 
is our prayers. And I've shared this before, but a, one of the true reflections of how much you love someone, remember, is how much you pray for that person. We must never underestimate the power of prayer. You know, I get so encouraged when someone says, hey, I've been praying for you or praying for your children. A little while ago, Catherine Shump came up and said, CJ, I've been praying for your kids. I just gave her a big hug. Because that's one of the most powerful things that we can do for one another. Don't underestimate that. In your small groups, wrestle for one another in prayer. Pray this prayer for your, for your group, for your small groups. You know, in the summer, we, we studied this out in our staff meetings, and we prayed for the entire church, this prayer for the entire church. We felt encouraged. Hopefully, you somehow had a, oh, what happened moment as maybe the Holy Spirit was at work through our prayers. But pray this prayer for one another that we will be deeply rooted in God's love, that we will know his love and so much that it surpasses understanding. It's a very powerful prayer. Okay, so let's have a look at the church's love and how, and how we have a responsibility. So there are a few verses within Ephesians that call us to love very, very specifically. And he basically says, so he's saying to them, listen, you do have a responsibility. You're not just in this place just to come and sing some songs and say hi to each other. But there is a depth of relationship that you need, and it's through that depth where God is glorified. Now, one thing I think that is great about our family, our community, is that we, when we do it right, we really know one another. Yesterday, we had a men's prayer breakfast what an amazing morning it was. So, so encouraging. And we broke up into little tables and we just spoke through different things. And it was so great just to hear even just the brothers be open and vulnerable and share about their need for community, but their need for brotherhood and other men being involved within their lives. I came away so encouraged and looking forward to what we're going to be doing next year. Oscar gave a little bit of a charge and he was talking about that when we, as a community, but particularly he was addressing the men yesterday, he said when we love one another at that level, at that type of depth, the world notices. People are looking for that level of relationship, particularly men. We sometimes don't do too well with that. But we have that here in an abundance if we only are willing to really devote ourselves to that and God will absolutely be glorified. Now, the problem is, when we're in a community like that, is that because we know each other very well, we can also rub each other the wrong way at times. And then the, our, you know, our interactions and the challenges get amplified because we're that close to one another. We are a family. How many of you grew up in a family where there were no arguments ever? Okay, there you go. Elijah, I love you. Thank you. That's my son. That's my son. Thanks so much. <laughs> but you see, that's what a family does. You can't help it because you're so close to one another. You know, I've been, I remember growing up in church, not, not this family of church, there were never any issues. You know why? Because at the end of the service, everyone's straight out the door. And you don't speak to each other until the next Sunday. And even then it's, how was your week? And you go through the formalities. You never really get deeply involved in each other's lives. You avoid all of the conflicts, all of the rubbing each other the wrong way. Why? Because they are, the relationships were shallow. That doesn't bring glory to God. You know, in sociology, there's this thought that the reason why, that one, of the, one of the benefits of family, but also benefits of religion, they, they are shared equally, is to help create um, well-rounded human beings that simply know how to get along in society. Sociologists say this, and they say that the, the, the impact of a family, on the family doing that in raising a child to be able to have that impact is powerful, but the church has the same function. The church has the same function. That's why we have one another. And we can't avoid, it once we do decide to get close and we invest in one another, it is going to happen. 
But look at what the Bible says as a result. Whoops, I've gone on too far. How did it get that far? Okay, so here in Ephesians 4 verse 2, we're told, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. See, whenever we show humility, gentleness, patience, God is glorified. You know why? Because in John 13, remember, Jesus says, all people will know you are my disciples by the way you love one another. See, what's the other option to this? It's pride, it's harshness, it's impatience, it's rejection, it's division. None of that glorifies God. Or the other option, as I said, is shallowness and superficial relationships. None of that glorifies God. You see, if we are so full of love, then we will, as I said, need to put these things in place. We'll need to be humble with one another. We'll need to be patient with one another. We'll need to be bearing with one another because we are so deeply involved in each other's lives. That's a good reflection, by the way, of how close we are to one another. That if we're willing to roll our sleeves up and get involved so deeply, we're going to have to put on these qualities as a result. Does that make sense? As I said, God places us and brings us in this community so that we can learn how to love. You know, there's a couple who've been coming out to church for a while now, and they, I, was, I love just hearing their stories of often people go church shopping and they land here, which is a real encouragement. And one of the, the, the guys said to me, he said, you know, we've been to many, many places and lots of places talk about love, but you guys are the real deal. That's God at work in your real relationships with one another. They are powerful and the world notices. People take note. Because you can't hide love. You can't. Keep doing what you're doing. God is glorified. People are encouraged. We are encouraged. You are encouraged by it. Keep going. Okay, let's move on. So bear with one another in love. To the next one he says, that the church's responsibility. It says, instead, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So here we see the church glorifies God through us speaking the truth with one another. Now, we've spoken about this a little while over this series. But one of the ways that we can do that is by being honest with one another and being willing to call one another higher to point each other to God. Now, the truth is, it's not easy to do that. Who of you loves people pointing out your faults? None of us. It's painful. I hate it, but I know it's good for me. And those words, when someone says to you, hey, can I have a word? What happens? You get butterflies in your stomach. It's awful. I hate it. But you know what? It's good for us. We need it in order to be able to grow. It says when we allow people into our lives, when we allow someone to point out maybe weaknesses in our character or things that maybe God's placed on their heart. For you, we grow into the mature body of Christ. And if all of us are continually helping each other grow, encouraging one another. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, every one of our conversations needs to be, can I have a word? That's a discouraging place to be. But if God has placed things on our hearts, if you've seen things in one another, we have a responsibility to point these things out to each other. You know, at the midweek, we did the Jahari window, remember? Hopefully, yes? Okay. Use that as a way to talk about and to bring things up with each other. Say, you know what? If you have a discipling partner or a prayer partner, why not say to each other, look, next year, let's pick three Christ-like characteristics that we want to grow in and help each other grow in. That's what the friendship is for. It's founded in love. And then you help each other. You, you, you point things out to each other. You pray for one another on those things. That's our responsibility. 
When we do that, we become more like Christ. As we become more like Christ, God is glorified. Okay, next thing. Ephesians 4, 16 says, From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the third responsibility of the church is for each one of us to be doing our part. We all have a responsibility. This is a church of doers, okay? We don't do to be saved. We do because we are saved, okay? God has placed us in this community, and he's given us works to do because of his love for us already. You know, I remember sharing at a midweek last year that imagine if Jesus came in and wanted to interview every one of us and say, hey, what's your role in the church? What do you do? How would we all feel about that conversation? Would we all be like, oh, Jesus, I can't even begin to tell you. I do this, I do that, I serve in this way. Or would some of us be thinking, I hope I'm not next? You see, we all have a responsibility to build up the church. Every one of us. And I love, you know, the lesson that Steve gave about our gifts and our calling and our responsibility. And it was so encouraging that so many of you signed up for many of the needs next year. But maybe there are things that God's placed on your heart that weren't one of those tables. Something that maybe God is calling you to serve in a particular way. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't deny what he may be trying to do within your life because it's for his glory in the end. Not yours, so you can buy it, look at what I do, but simply his glory as we all do our part to build up the church. As we do that, we, it's a reflection of your love, by the way, your love for God. We can all say, oh, I love the church. Yeah, but what do you do? See, what you do is a reflection of your love, Okay. Okay, now, what do you notice about all of these? Every one of them says we do those things in love. In love. They are all expressions of love. Take out the love part and let's examine what we've got instead. So instead of bear with one another, take out the love part, it's tolerate one another. How does that sound? Imagine you're in a family, or you're married, or you have a household, and you're like, oh, you guys, you know, it's great to see you together. Yeah, we tolerate each other. <laughs> that does not sound like, a, sound like a nice family to be a part of, does it? If we're not careful, and if we remove love from our interactions, then we're just here putting up with each other. That's not the place that Jesus died for. A place of love. We bear with one another. That's the source of our patience. That's the source of us bearing. It's, it's love. Look at the next one. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we may just speak the truth in a harsh, hurtful way. And when someone says, hey, can I have a word? You're like, no way. There is no way you can have a word with me. Have a word with Jesus first. <laughs> then come and have a word with me. You see, love makes the difference. Love makes whatever that person's going to say bearable, acceptable. Look at the last one. So instead of working to build up the church in love, if we are all doing our parts without love, then it becomes very judgmental and legalistic because then we say look at what I'm doing what are you doing oh you don't do this and we point fingers at one another and think that we are so great and we are doing so many great things for God just legalism and we judge one another with it but in love you're looking at yourself only and you're saying what am I doing what do I bring to build up this church everything we do must come from a place of love Absolutely everything. Every response, every reaction, every action is love. Not out of duty, not out of obligation, not out of religiosity, not out of fear, 
but out of love, in love, because of love. That's how we glorify God. So how did the church end up doing? Well, we don't really hear about the church in Ephesus until another 30 years later. And where do we find them 30 years later? What book? Revelation. Well done, Nicole. So we see them in the book of Revelation, and they're one of the seven churches that Jesus specifically wrote to. So he's given them this charge to love, 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 30 years before. Hopefully they took it all on board. They're loving one another. They're amazing. Let's see what happens. So Revelation 2. I know your deeds, Jesus says to the church, your hard work, your perseverance, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. How's the church doing? Pretty good. You look at that and you think, wow, they're, you know, they've persevered in their faith. They've got rid of false apostles. They're doing really well. Like Jesus must be so proud of them. Then the very next verse says this. Yet, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. But weren't they doing great in the previous verse? He's like, no, you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. What were the things that they did at first? They loved. And that was it. They loved. Yes, you, you got right doctrine. But where is love? It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13. If you can have all, give all your money to the poor and ha do not have love, you're nothing. If you have all the teachings and knowledge and understanding, but you don't have love, you're just a sounding gong, just making a noise. Nothing. That's what he's saying to them. You've got great things. You're doing awesome. But what's happened to your love? As he looks at us, as we go into this next year, as we've been focusing on love for one another the last few months, What's one thing that Jesus wants you to take away and hold on to going into next year, going into Christmas for the rest of your life? What is that one thing? It's, of course, going to be love. But what does that look like for you being a part of this community? You know, I don't know how for sure the, the Ephesian church ended up doing. But by the fourth century, they'd become part of the Roman Catholic church. They'd accepted Mary as a mother of God, and it, you know, it seemed to have gone perhaps downhill from there because they didn't hold on to their first love. Where will the West Side Church end up? This is an amazing place, an amazing place. And we'll end up in a good place, but all we need to do is hold on to love. Love for God and love for one another, and God will be glorified. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, CJ. That was such a good lesson. Such a good way to end off the, um, this series about loving one another uh, and about um, relationships and friendships. So I'm going to uh, transition us into communion. Um, and something I've been learning a little bit lately is that love is really difficult. And I know that seems obvious. Maybe you've read the Bible a lot. Maybe you've even looked at the life of Jesus and thought, and that's supernatural for you. But when I became a Christian... The, the uh, message primarily given to me was love is so, feels amazing. Love feels so great. Like you're going to feel awesome when you accept Jesus. And it's going to be easy. And because, because my old church, love my old church, by the way. became a Christian there. It was amazing. Uh, and, and, but they, that's what they fed me, you know. And, and now that I'm going through trials, I'm saying, whoa, love is really hard. Love doesn't always look that great. And, and I used to think love is a feeling, but actually love has to do a lot more with actions. And if you look at Jesus, he said, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? 
It, it means to obey his commands. That's what, John, that's what John says, John 15. And 1 John says the same thing. And then I look at the actual life of Jesus. How hard it was to love us, probably, for Jesus. How difficult it was for him to go to the cross for us. He had to pray on his knees for strength for our sake. And he sweat for us because he loved us that much. Are we willing to love like Jesus? To bear up with one another in love. And that means, man, sometimes I'm going to sacrifice. But what kind of community would we have if every single one of us, if you and you and you and us, we all decided let's have the love of Jesus. That'd be amazing. So I'm going to pray us into communion as we reflect on the love Jesus had for us. Father God, um, we bow down before you because you deserve it, but even, and you created the world and you created everything, but also because you, you decide to give us such close attention and love. Not just, you don't just say it, you actually came and died for our sake, God, because you love us. And it was the only way you could reconcile us to you because you want to be reconciled to us, God. Knowing that just breaks our spirits, Lord. I really pray that, that as we do communion um, and we reflect on the cross, that you'd be present with each individual here. I pray that as we reflect, um, we could experience with power what is the full love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, Jesus, through communion. I pray that you bless the body and blood. Jesus, I pray. Amen.